introduce our speaker, I would like to introduce to you a member of the faculty at North Idaho College who has taught here many years. She chairs the Division of Business Administration. And in introducing her, I can truly say that in all the time that I have known her, every single day when I saw her on campus, she always smiled and had a friendly comment and always encourages and never discourages you. Many of you know her. Let's give a warm welcome to the Chairman of the Business Department, Betty McLean. Before introducing the final speaker of this convocation series, I want to take just a moment to give all of us the opportunity to express our thanks to the committees and especially to the committee chair people, Tony Stewart, who never takes any credit for anything. He's very modest in that respect, and Leona Hassan. Their, their committees that they have chaired have worked very hard to bring us this exciting week, and I think we should take just a minute to say thank you. Our speaker this morning is the Reverend Dr. Richard T. McSorley, a professor of theology at Georgetown University. Dr. McSorley is the director of the Center for Peace Studies at Georgetown. He entered the Jesuit order at the age of 17. After completing a graduate degree in philosophy, he went to the Philippine Islands to teach at the Jesuit University. There he became a prisoner of the Japanese from 1941 to 1945. He is the author of four books, many articles. Father McSorley is a member of the St. Francis Catholic Worker Community in Washington, D.C., which takes care of the homeless. Dr. McSorley will speak on a biblical basis for peacemaking in the nuclear age. At the conclusion of his book, which is entitled Kill for Peace, he leaves the reader with a message of hope and that with God's help and faith, peace is possible. This has been an exciting week, a week which has motivated us to do a lot of thinking and in some aspects a very scary, sort of a threatening week. So with this message of hope that I know he's going to bring uh, to us, I introduce to you with pleasure, Father McSorley. If you want to talk about nuclear weapons and the gospel, uh, there are two aspects of it that I think uh, can give you a, a good uh, point for understanding both the gospel and the nuclear age. One is the technology of today, uh, nuclear technology, what is it? How has it changed our world? And uh, just look at that from American scientists and American military men uh, telling us what it is. And then against the backdrop of that technology to look at with a new look at the New Testament, the Gospel. Whether we are Christians or not, the New Testament is a document that has a human value and that expresses a sense of the value of humans that all people everywhere appreciate. So I think that that's what I'll do. Just take about 20 minutes for the nuclear technology, a slideshow, and then 20 minutes on the Gospel, and then 20 minutes for your questions. And you'll tell me at the end of 20 minutes. All right, if we have the lights out, then. Can you see this? Can you see this? Everybody can see it. All right, that, that's just a, a slide to uh, symbolize war and peace, uh, the growing wheat against the uh, charred background. Peace is whatever brings me close to God and my neighbor simultaneously. It's what reconciles me. Peace is reconciliation with God and my neighbor simultaneously. Not just my neighbor, not just my God and myself, but my God and my neighbor. 
reconciled. We are at home. There are no, no fences between us. We talk to each other, both my God and my neighbor. That's peace. So if, if you accept that definition, and it's a definition given in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 10 to 20 or so, if you accept that as a working definition of peace, and I do, then to talk about peace without God is nonsense. And to talk about uh, just dealing with God in myself and having peace and forgetting my neighbor is nonsense. Peace is simultaneously reconciled, being at, being at one, at home with my God and my neighbor. A lot more could be said about that. We are in the nuclear age. So <clears throat> the peace, if we're ever going to have peace, it's going to be peace in the nuclear age. And that's not going to be easy. Can you put those lights out that are on the screen? Because it, you can't see the print of the screen with the lights on it. Or maybe we can move this screen. All right, that's got it. <clears throat> Einstein was one of the, uh, one of the uh, formulators of the nuclear age in the sense that he was able to uh, convert <clears throat> mass into energy, which is really what happened with fission. He says, the splitting of the atom has changed everything about our life except our way of thinking. And because our way of thinking has not changed, we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. Our way of thinking is that the more weapons we have, our old way of thinking, the more weapons we have, the safer we are. The more technology we have, the sure are we will be to win. That's no longer true. The old way of thinking is illustrated by the uh, program of President Reagan. Five more years of uh, <clears throat> building 17,000 more nuclear weapons and we will be more secure. It's not true. We are, the more weapons we have, the less secure we are. There is no security in additional numbers. I think Congressman Craig would, was saying something of that. It's not just uh, the scientists, but the military men. General Taylor, uh, General um, Bradley of World War II fame, says very much the same as Einstein, that it, the size of the, of the problem is not what scares me or makes it more uh, difficult, but our, our unwillingness to think about it. So I want to congratulate you and, and uh, Tony Stewart and the students for thinking about it. You have a very good uh, student presence here, and you've had a very good week of discussion of the number one moral issue of our, of our times, better than most schools, I think, in the East. One way of trying to understand the uh, nuclear issue is to compare uh, the nuclear age, is to compare it with what, what we had in the ages before it. Here you see <coughs> a chart, which uh, you probably can't see very much in the back. One ton of TNT is equivalent without a flame touching. It'll just get so hot, just past its combustion point, and then it will, it will be swept away. Uh, the movie would show it just being swept right off its hinges, right off its uh, foundation. A stone house with the same sort of thing. The fireball, uh, well, the, the pressure hits it, the windows and doors go out. The fireball begins to heat it up, and it uh, is destroyed. The pressure would, this is a five-pound pressure, would reach from a 20-megaton bomb. 45 miles away would be five pounds pressure. This is what five pounds pressure will do to a loaded box car. This is tested in the Nevada testing. A, uh, a bus receiving six pounds pressure and a turned over bus in the background. The pressure at the center would be about 2,100 pounds. And it would go out uh, from a 20 megaton bomb, it would go out and then get weaker and weaker as it went out. After about uh, uh, 10 miles, it would be sucked back but the, the, the fire would start simultaneously about 38 miles away and burn everything burnable. 
or war can be defined a thousand ways, war against poverty, war against anything. War is intergroup lethal conflict. Intergroup, it's, it's not just person to person, lethal, deadly conflict. Now, if that doesn't define sharply enough what war is, then add these characteristics, which are historically what you find in war. War has these characteristics. First, much killing. Second, a uh, mobilization of group against group. And third, a, uh, a uh, momentum of its own that carries both sides to a, to a uh, savagery which is unplanned by either side. Now ask the question about the New Testament. Does the New Testament approve of intergroup lethal conflict which has as its characteristics much killing, mobilization of group against group, and a momentum of its own which carries both sides to unplanned uh, savagery? The answer clearly is no. Why is it that the New Testament does not approve of war? Well, here are four principles of the New Testament, so basic, so primary, that if you did away with them, you would do away with, do it away with any one of them. You would do away with the New Testament. And all of them are opposed to all war. The first principle is, and all of this is pretty well known to you, but in the light of the nuclear age, it takes on a new meaning. First principle is love. And not simply, Jesus didn't simply say love, love one another, but he said, love the outcast, love the Samaritan. In the United States, that would be love the uh, mi minority group, love the black and the Chinese and the others are, who are among us. And if I say, well, I, I do, I love the, the black people, and I love the children, I love the outcast, and people say, good, God bless you. But if I also say, I also love Anderpop, and I love communists, and I would like you people to begin to love Andropop and the communist, then people don't say, God bless you. They say just the opposite. They say, who let him in here? Check him out. Get the FBI. What's, where'd he come from? And yet that's, that's our faith. That's the faith of the Christian. Love your enemies. What, uh, what Christian, mainline Christians, Catholics that I'm very familiar with, they don't, they don't say say it that way. We don't, we don't take that, Jesus. We don't believe that anymore. No, they don't say that. They say something else like this. They say, well, see that door back there? Well, there are people behind that door with red shirts on. They're communists. There are 10 of them over there. They're threatening you, threatening your freedom, threatening your religion. Now, I look at you and I see you're interested in peace. I see you're American. I see you're good people. I'm going to do you a favor. I get my guns and da 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 shoot them dead. I come back and say, give me a medal. I saved you. Now that's what most Christians, mainline Christians say outside of the peace churches. They say we can kill some to save others. That's really a caricature of what the just war theory is. When I, when I bring this up and discuss it with uh, other priests, uh, they say, well, uh, you're doing some good. You're, you're loving the people that you, that you uh, save. I said, sure, you're doing some good. But is it the gospel? And they say, well, uh, I follow the theory that you can, it's enough to do some good. I said, that's fine. That's a good theory. That's better than killing everybody. But the gospel doesn't say just kill, kill your enemies and save your friends. The gospel says love your enemies. Now, are you telling me that in the act of killing those communists, I am loving them? Well, you're loving somebody else. I said, well, I, is that the, that's not the gospel. The gospel is love your enemy. And well, that's where the two theories differ, and that's the clearest answer to it. But that's not the end of it. Love your enemies is not marginal to the gospel. It is the center point. It is the centerpiece. It is Jesus trying to get us to understand how God loved us. He loves us when we're enemies. He loves us when we're sinners. He loves us, and we know this not only from our own experience, but we know that there is no other kind of love except love that seeks no return. We don't even need the gospel to know that the genuine article of love is not a tit-for-tat affair. If I say, well, I'll love you as long as you appeal to me, well, you're not impressed. That's not love. If I say I'll love you for $50 a week, well, that's not love. We don't get a lot of the of the genuine article, but none of us need to be told what love is. We experience it 
sometimes from our mother or for someone who unconditionally without seeking any return gives something, gives themselves to us. That's what God does for us and what he is saying is in, in the New Testament, be like me, love one another, do not love in order to get a return. And we, as I say, it's not just gospel, it is also our own experience. So that if we, if we are to <coughs> follow the gospel, it doesn't mean we couldn't have used some force, but it would have to be less than lethal force. It would have to be a force which makes it possible, like if I spank a child for uh, endangering himself with a knife or playing in the street, the child in a, in a moment can uh, forget the tears and embrace me. But if I spank the child till I kill the child, I'm a murderer. And I've put the child beyond reconciliation with me. So that's the first principle. The second principle is uh, connected with the first. And this is the whole theology of peace. And a child can understand it. And then all the great religions of the world teach it. And it's very simple. It can be put in two sentences. And here it is. There's only one God. And we are all the children of that one God. And so wherever I kill a human being anywhere, I kill a brother or sister. And wherever I kill a, a, a human being anywhere, I offend the father of that brother or sister. Now, what would you think of me if I, if I said, uh, well, I love you. I think, John, you're a good man, or Mary, you're a good woman. But that brat you've got as a boy, as a son, I'm going to kill him. Well, what would you think of me? What does God think of us when we say, God, we love you, but you're getting ready to kill your children? What can he think of us? What does he think of us when we pray for <coughs> his help to do that killing? The third principle is that the gospel teaches us that there's a relation of harmony between the means we use to do anything and the end that we accomplish in the doing of it. The gospel teaches us that the purpose of life is to participate the divine life forever. And the way to it Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, take in the stranger, visit the sick, bear one another's burdens along the way of life. All means compatible, harmonious with the goal of love. And in ordinary life, we, we have no question about that. If you want to go to Washington, you set out in, in the direction of Washington. If, if I found you driving around a block here in Coeur d'Alene in a car, and I asked where you're going, you say you're going to Washington, I said, well, you got to turn then. You know, no, 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 I'm just going to Washington in a circle. Well, I'd say, well, you're good luck, you know. But I would think you're a little bit off, you're a little bit out of your head. It's the very definition of being out of your head if you can't relate the means you're taking to the, uh, to the end that you're seeking. And that's all of our life. In everything else except the military, we do that. But in the military, we say, everything goes. We will have peace through war. We will have peace through strength, which means we're ready to, to kill people. We will have peace through killing, rape, burning, every kind of mayhem. We'll have peace through deception, lying, and destruction. With, out of that, we will get order, morality, and peace. Every political science course that I've ever heard of teaches that. Every college teaches that. Every nation follows that. And it's not only opposed to the gospel, it's contradictory to the gospel. The gospel says, out of an evil tree you will not get a good fruit. You get an evil fruit. Only out of a good tree will you get good fruit. The means and the end are compatible. And you can see it in, you can, we can see it in people around us, you can see it in people on the national level, international level. One example is Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who has been taking care of the, of the uh, dying in the streets of Calcutta for 25 years. And she was interviewed on television and, and asked, how, how can you do this for 25 years? Keep going and taking these vermin-ridden people in your arms. She said, oh, it's not so hard if you have faith. But Mother Teresa, how do you keep your faith going for 25 years? And she said, well, when I hold the dying in my arms, I believe that I'm holding Jesus. See, the perfect identification of serving neighbor and God in the one act. Those people are rare. Some people do it in their lives fairly well. And when, the, when we see somebody doing that, 
their service of God and their neighbor together, we say they're biblical people. They're gospel people. That's what it means. It's one of the teaching of the gospel. The final principle uh, that I want to talk about is, uh, and this is the end, uh, that the, the gospel teaches us that the way of holiness is best defined not by some vague abstraction like do good, avoid evil, follow your conscience, be righteous. They're all good, but they're vague. The gospel teaches us that the way of holiness is to imitate Jesus, and that's not vague. The God the Father didn't give us a book or a set of slogans. He gave us his son. He gave us a person. He gave us a baby who grew up to be a man, who lived in a poor family, who identified himself in solidarity with the poor, and his public life didn't have a place to rest his head, and in death rested his head on a cross crowned with thorns, and who taught the doctrine of loving service. Now that's, that's the example that the gospel puts before us of the way to peace and the way to, to holiness. We can't imagine Jesus pushing the button for a nuclear bomb, or wearing the uniform of any national state, or registering for it, or paying taxes for nuclear weapons or any weapons of death, or working in a, in a plant that makes weapons of death in any country. Jesus is the, the uh, representative of God on earth, as Christians believe, teaching us the way of holiness. He summarized everything he said, and his summary of what he said was in line perfectly with his life. He said it in three words, love your enemies. Thank you. 